Hey guys. This is what if Naruto was adopted by the Umbu. NBU collectively adopts Naruto. Indefinite babysitting duty was so not on Kakashi's list of things he wanted to do with his life. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 1. Not My Style Sarutobi sighed heavily, leaning back in his worn padded chair. He loved the old thing. He'd chosen it especially when he'd first made Hokage as a teenager, back when he was too short for his feet to touch the floor if he sat back in the cushy, fluffy thing. In this chair, he'd faced many troublemakers and passed many laws. Here he'd cuddled his three children and one grandson, and played both aggravator and peacekeeper. From here, he'd ruled a kingdom. Today, his faithful chair was the place he had chosen to sit as he rocked the plaintively crying infant in his arms gently, trying to soothe it. The boy was barely three months old, but he already had vivid blonde hair and a wide smile. Of course, he wasn't smiling now. No, he was screaming, sobbing, his blue eyes clenched tightly closed against the world. Sure, sure, it's okay, little one, Saratobi said calmly, unruffled by the loud noises. You're safe now. Hush. Eventually, the baby's wailing ebbed, until he was snuffling slightly against Saratobi's chest, face buried in the old man's neck, breath catching in a sob occasionally. Saratobi waited patiently, rocking the infant to sleep, some distant part of him amused to see the ANBU who had brought him here still standing stiff and unmoving at attention in the middle of his office, and wondered vaguely how long he could keep it up. Dog, the sand dame said eventually, shifting the now sleeping baby to lie in his arms the conventional way instead of propped up against his chest in a hug. Tell me what happened. The ANBU bowed his head and began to speak in a brisk, clipped tone. A group of intoxicated civilians broke into the house the boy has been inhabiting, and proceeded to attack as he lay on a rug on the living room floor, he said formally. I intercepted and apprehended them, and with the help of my partner, Owl, subdued and arrested them. The infant was highly distressed but appeared unhurt. Saratobi nodded, tracing the little boy's soft cheek. And what of Aya-san? He asked. Was she injured? Dog hesitated a beat before saying tonelessly, the child's guardian was not present. She had left the house several hours before the attack. The old man's hand clenched, gripping the soft blanket dog had thought to wrap the child in before he'd brought him here. Aya, the woman he had charged with caring for the baby, had abandoned him, and then a group of drunken villagers attacked him. How much longer can hatred for this innocent child fester in my village? He said sadly almost to himself. The ANBU shifted slightly. Permission to speak freely, sir? He asked. Saratobi nodded once and waved his hand, gesturing dog to continue. This is getting ridiculous. He burst forth. Every other day, someone attacks him. The village wants him dead, Hokage-sama. It, he needs to be protected better than this, the masked man finished lamely. The Hokage shook his head. I understand you, dog, I really do, he said to the rather short ANBU standing before him. But the problem is, what do we do with him? I can find no better way to deal with this situation than to leave things as is and hope and pray the villagers will grow to accept him. Dog snorted derisively. That's never going to happen, he said flatly. People are far too good at holding grudges. Do you have a solution to offer? Saratobi questioned. Sincerely curious and with a sneaking suspicion that the entire purpose of Dog's visit was to tell him one such solution. As expected, Dog nodded. I do, sir, he said. I propose the child is taken into ANBU custody. There are sects that specialize in the raising and training of children. He could disappear into ANBU, at least until he is strong enough to defend himself from angry drunks. Saratobi frowned unconsciously tightening his grip on the baby. I had hoped to give him a childhood as close to normal as possible, he reminded the ANBU. He needs to be among people, needs a chance to get to know children his own age and participate in a community. 
Sir, if things keep on the way they are, he won't get that dog replied. People hate him. There's no way they're ever going to let their children play with him. It's not going to happen. And frankly, better isolated in the NBU than dead before his first birthday. However, if he disappears, in a few years' time, you can reintroduce him into the village under a different name, and he is sure to be better received. Saratobi considered, rearranging the blanket around the sleeping bundle in his arms. Finally, he sighed and nodded. Very well, dog. I will accept your solution. Take the boy. Give him to ANBU Agent Mouse. She can be charged with his care for the first few months. Dog nodded. Mouse had been pulled off active duty due to a severe leg injury, and had been cooped up in ANBU HQ since then. It was a good choice. Yes, sir. The boy is to be addressed as Pup, I think, in any and all reports, requests, memos and notes sent from ANBU regarding him, Saratobi continued. If he is to disappear, he will disappear completely. His given name, however, should be used to his face. I will not take the name his father gave him away. He has no surname while in ANBU. Yes, sir. Dog bowed before carefully taking the baby in his arms. He held the infant gingerly, as if frightened the kid would break. A moment later, he was gone in a twist of smoke. Saratobi dug in his pocket for his pipe and leaned back in his well-loved chair. Lemur, he called, and another ANBU, one of his guards, flickered into the visible spectrum. Sir. Go into the village, Saratobi ordered, tapping his pipe to clear it before stuffing fresh tobacco into it. Spread the news. Uzumaki Naruto was killed this morning. ANBU codenamed Owl stood on one side of a two-way mirror watching as the four men on the other side slowly sobered up. These people were little better than dirt in Al's mind, having spent a month and a half guarding the brat they tried to kill and finding him to be nothing more than a baby. What kind of monster kills a baby? Well, without an order from the Hokage to do so, the elite assassin had to add. These bloody civilians. So here they were in an ANBU interrogation cell. Owl was desperately hoping for the chance to misinterpret an order and give them a few marks to remember him by before he was forced to, once again, let them go. The door opened behind him and Dog entered, holding that telltale blue bundle to his chest awkwardly. Owl grinned behind his porcelain mask. Poor Dog, he had no clue when it came to babies. He was probably scared to put the kid down. Hey, Dog, he said casually to his teammate turning back to the prisoners. What did the Hokage say? The child will be raised in ANBU until he can be safely integrated back into the village. He's been officially declared dead. Al blinked. So what'll that mean for them? He asked, pointing at the four men, two of which were vomiting as their bodies rejected the alcohol they'd consumed. Al fought a snigger. Civvies couldn't hold their liquor. Dog shrugged. They attacked and killed a civilian child. That's premeditated murder of an infant. They'll be tried for treason and if found guilty, should be executed. Somehow though, I think they'll get off with a prison sentence. Al nodded. If not a severe warning, he said bitterly, the public will cry out for their release. But execution would be daft. Why make them into martyrs? H.N. Dog considered the men with distinct distaste for a moment before turning away. I have to take the kid to Mouse. Do you know where she is this time of day? Mouse? Good choice. Um, she's usually over at East Wing, training, trying to force her leg to heal quicker and inevitably slowing the process, Al said casually, leaning back against the mirror and looking down at the shorter by head A and B U. Say, if they killed the brat and all, do you think Head would mind if I roughed him up a bit? Dog rolled his eyes. If you must, he sighed, turning away. Just don't kill them, or make it too obvious. No blood. Don't make them into martyrs. Owl's hidden grin was feral. Gotcha, he said, turning back to peer predatorily at his four new victims. Then he thought of something and glanced back at Dog, who was making to leave. Hey, Dog, what's the kid's name gonna be? Dog was halfway out the door, and paused half a beat before saying simply, Pup 
and sweeping away, arms awkwardly clamped around the infant. Owl raised a brown eyebrow behind his mask. Pup? He repeated, shaking his head. A code name already. That kid is destined for high places. Focusing once again on the four prisoners, Owl cracked his knuckles and cackled. Oh, this was going to be fun. That night, there was a celebration in the village hidden in the leaves. Saratobi watched the milling crowds below from the window of his tower, shaking his head regretfully as their shouts and laughter reached him. The 4th of January would likely become something of an unofficial festival in the years to come, the day the QB brat was finally disposed of. Someone pounded on his door, but he totally ignored it. People had been streaming into his office all day, each demanding the release of the four men who had done the deed. His council members wanted to gather and gloat at him, but he hadn't attended the meeting. Instead, he was enjoying the joys of a newly installed lock on the door. Said door rattled for a moment as whoever it was tried to force his or her way in, and then fell silent as he or she gave up. You can't ignore us forever, Hokage-sama. A voice reached through to him, but he totally ignored it. So, he mused to himself, what are you going to do with your murderers? He hadn't been able to place them with the Uchiha in the public jail, despite the numerous claims that, as they were civilians, they shouldn't be held by ANBU, simply because at the time they'd been getting false memories implanted in their minds so that their story would stand up under questioning. But that was done now and half an hour ago he'd given the order to have the men moved to maximum security in jail. He couldn't execute them. That was for certain. Nor, judging from the crowds dancing and feasting below, could he imprison them for anything near as long as he wanted to. He could give them a choice, Saratobi thought. After their trial, once they were found guilty, and by hellfire, they would be, he could give them a choice, say, thirty years in jail, the maximum sentence for premeditated murder, or a public lashing. Knowing the men, they'd all choose the quick, painful route, and Saratobi could feel slightly vindicated as he watched them beaten until they bled. Ah, corporal punishment. How he loved it. Mouse hummed to herself as she limped through her new, and larger, quarters. Agreeing to take in a child that had been officially declared dead had its perks. Reaching into the crib that had been set up for her, she lifted the fussing baby, cooing to him absently. There now. Hush, hush. You're probably hungry, right? Well, we'll deal with that right now. Propping the baby up against her shoulder with one arm, she walked to the kitchen section of her quarters. She had a sink, a fridge, and a dishwasher. How cool was that? And digging around for some baby formula and a bottle. She made it up quickly double-checking the temperature was right and wouldn't burn the baby's mouth before she offered it to him. Naruto latched onto the rubber teat instantly, blue eyes staring up at her in amazement before flicking around the room, taking in everything. Mouse smiled, she loved this age. They were just so interested in everything, wiring up their eyes before they learned how to move anything else. Is that better, little pup? She asked, sitting down on her bed to feed the blonde infant. Naruto's response was to shift his gaze back to her masked face for a moment, before he went back to looking around. Mouse chuckled a little, running a hand over his little stomach and soft legs. She was going to enjoy this assignment. With her free hand, she reached up and pulled off her mask, allowing the boy to see her features and grinning as his eyes widened in surprise. He didn't stop drinking for a moment. A soft knock on the door caught her attention and she quickly replaced the porcelain before calling, Enter. The door opened slowly and Dog came in, carrying a manila folder. I've brought you the boy's file, he said without so much as a hello. It contains birthday, blood type, allergies and so on. That should be all you need to look after him. The Hokage wants you to contact him directly if there is a problem. The short masked figure placed the folder on the table in the center of the room. She got a table. Squee! Nodded and turned to leave, but Mouse called after him. Dog. Wait a moment. Ah, do you want to, you know, if you want to visit the baby, you're welcome to. I have no interest in the child, Dog cut in acidly. I am merely following orders, 
and now my obligations have been fulfilled. Good day. Mouse frowned at his back. Kakashi! She snapped. You know you're being unfair. His father. His dead dog interrupted again without turning. Let him rest. Either way, I want nothing more to do with his son. Mouse winced as he left, closing the door with a little more force than necessary. Don't worry, she said to the baby in her arms. He'll come around. He's just hurting, you know? Grieving. And he really does care what happens to you. He saved you from those nasty men, didn't he? And he brought you here. Just give him time. I mean, he's really just a kid as well, isn't he? He's only fourteen. Shaking her head, the injured a and woman lifted the baby higher and continued to feed him, firmly pushing her dog-masked comrade out of her mind. Eighteen months old. Now eighteen months old, Naruto didn't need to be watched every second. He was sitting on a rug in the center of a locked, child-safe room, surrounded by a great many educational toys. Currently, he was sucking his left thumb, his favorite stuffed toy animal tucked into his left elbow, while his right hand worked to fit a square block through a triangular hole in the side of a box. After a few moments, he stopped and examined the block, then very carefully moved it to the square hole a few inches away from the triangular one. It fit in with minimal effort, and Naruto grinned widely. Now that all the blocks were safe in the box— Naruto moved on to a weird device that frequently made noises and sounds when he pushed random buttons on it. Tentatively, he pressed down on the red button. A siren sounded, and he grinned, happily banging the button again. Next, he pushed against the blue one, and a weird little chamber of the plastic device began to spin, showing him several pictures in quick succession. A set of blue eyes lit up as the child spied the ultimate temptation, an orange button. Instantly, he hit it as hard as he could, and the device promptly seemed to explode, several noises going off at once as other buttons were bumped and a small compartment bursting open. Out popped a small, soft plastic toy, a pig with a huge grin, and a recorded voice said oink oink, before the pig was retracted and the hinge door snapped shut. Oink oink, Naruto repeated happily, banging the button again. He loved this toy. The door opened with a pressurized whoosh, and Naruto turned his stout upper body in time to see a small, brown animal trot into the room, pause, and sniff him. Well, you don't need to be changed, he said in a low, gravely voice. Kakashi! It's safe! Naruto frowned and cocked his head. He vaguely recognized this creature. Doggy? He questioned slowly, and the brown creature glanced at him. Naruto was sure now, this furry animal was a doggy, which meant that. Doggy! He shouted as a growed up entered the room, holding a brown paper bag. The man stopped and winced, but Naruto didn't notice as he climbed to his feet and made his wobbly way over to the silver haired man. Hello, pup, the man began, but yelped and snapped out his hands to catch the child as he stumbled and fell. Doggy! Naruto repeated seriously, looking up at the white and red patterned face. Okay. Doggy. He held out his favorite plush toy. Kakashi stared at it for a second, then sighed. Damn it, Mouse has a sick sense of humor. Yes, pup, it's a dog. Well done. Naruto was frowning in confusion at this speech, his head cocked as he tried to follow. Doggy, he said eventually. Kakashi stared at him for a long second. Growing up in Anbiu, where the adults rarely spoke, meant that Naruto had a very limited vocabulary. The sum of all the words he could speak only amounted to seven words, three of which he couldn't say properly. He also had various baby words and half-sounds, but in the end, all he said was okay, meaning look, oink, bring, undry, instead of hungry, dat, that, un, and of course, doggy. Why am I here? Kakashi asked himself. He looked down at his hands, still holding the toddler up, and remembered the paper bag. Oh yeah. Mouse is on a mission. Someone had to feed him. Hummingbird asked me to pass it along, damn females. Doggy? Naruto pressed, big, wide, familiar eyes looking hurt and confused. 
Kakashi sighed heavily. That's a nice toy, he said grudgingly. What's its name? Wink. Naruto said brightly. Kakashi rolled his eyes. Figures. I need to go now, he said in a monotone. Here is lunch. Are you hungry? Ungry? Naruto repeated the word he recognized. Kakashi offered him the paper bag, and his eyes lit up. On. Letting both the child and the bag go, Kakashi retreated quickly, pausing outside the door to take a shaky breath. He hated seeing the kid. It reminded him too much of... of Sensei. It was easier for the fifteen-year-old to stay away. Twenty-eight months old. The old Hokage was sitting on the floor of the playroom, looking singularly undignified, smiling at the two-foot-high blonde bundle of energy that had recently turned two and four months old. The child was sitting opposite him, and between them was a child's puzzle with only eight pieces. Naruto was just fitting the last piece in, and he smiled widely. Doggy, he announced. Saratobi sighed and shook his head. No, Naruto, this is a frog, he said gently, pointing to the picture. Froggy. Naruto frowned. Froggy? He repeated cautiously. Saratobi nodded, and his grin came back. Doggy froggy. He chanted and giggled happily. The sand aim shook his head, smiling as he laughed. Good enough, he said. Naruto didn't reply, instead hoisting himself onto his chubby legs and toddling away. He had mastered the art of walking with scarcely a wobble, and Sarutobi knew that Ox and B had taken to taking him to the underground training area A and BU had and beginning basic exercises with him, incidentally going directly against orders but getting away with it by arguing that they'd been playing, not training. Either way, Naruto seemed to enjoy it, so Saratobi saw no need to interfere. And he was learning to talk better, too, which was a relief. The child was unnaturally small for his age, so much so that Saratobi would be concerned that he was being neglected and thus his growth being stunted if he didn't have it on good authority that dog had terrified his various carers into feeding him at least four times a day. The Hokage cracked a smile again at the thought. Despite the fact that Kakashi couldn't stand to be around the child, he still cared greatly for what happened to Minato's son. It was this distant protectiveness that let Saratobi feel at ease with the child's current situation. No harm would ever befall Naruto on Kakashi's watch. Unfortunately, Mouse had been killed on a mission eight months ago, so Naruto had no specific carer, but he seemed to be coping well when he was left generally to his own devices not minding if different people came to change, feed and occasionally play with him. Something that fascinated Saratobi was the way Naruto seemed able to distinguish between the masks of the ANBU, even those he had never seen before, with the ease that many could distinguish between people's real faces. After speaking to a psychologist, he had learned that a child's facial recognition system was wired up at a very young age and based on the people around him so Naruto would always be able to distinguish different ANBU masks, but would have a hard time, at least at first, until his facial recognition system rewired, telling apart real human faces. What are you looking for, Naruto? Sarutobi asked when Naruto began rooting through the drawers lining the side of the playroom. Wink, the boy said firmly. Sarutobi smiled and pulled himself to his feet, wincing as he felt his old bones creaking. Oink, he repeated, amusement tinging his voice. Okay, let's find him. It took approximately eight minutes to find Oink stashed firmly behind the chest of drawers, and Naruto instantly latched onto the fuzzy canine, his legs giving out to land him with a plop on his sound behind on the floor. Sarutobi joined the child a moment later, and soon he had Naruto, and Oink curled up in his lap while he read the child a story. As he read, Saratobi mentally mused that it was probably getting near the time when Naruto would have to be reintegrated with society as a whole. He needed to be young enough not to tell anyone what had happened in his life, which meant under four, or else the Hokage would have to wait until he was old enough not to say anything, which would mean fifteen or sixteen. Waiting that long was unfair and unhealthy to the child, 
so Saratobi made a mental note to begin arranging for the child to leave the protection of the NBU. Two years, ten months old. Saratobi smiled just a little and stretched, working the kinks out of his aching back. It had taken him six hours of mind-numbing paperwork, but it was finally all arranged. Everything was in place, ready for Naruto to reappear in his village. Just one thing left to do. The Hokage hummed a little as he carefully emptied the third drawer in his desk and placed a stack of folders, files and papers half a foot high into it, locking it securely. They would be safe there until he was ready to begin Naruto's reintegration. Hopefully, things would go better this time. With this pressing matter out of the way, he reached for a red scroll about the size of a cigar, quickly unsealing it and unrolling it across his desk, reading it swiftly. It was an update from Kakashi, who had been on a long-term mission for the last six months and was getting bored with stakeout duty, apparently. Sarutobi chuckled as he read the report, which was laced with a jaded undertone and contained many pleas for mercy. The Hokage shook his head. Kakashi would be done soon, anyway. He just had to survive another two months. Dipping his brush into his inkwell, he quickly signed the scroll to say he had read it and placed it in his out tray, ready to be logged and stored by his Hokage slaves. Ah, uh, Chunin. No, wait, Hokage slaves. With a triumphant grin, the Sandame realized he had finished his paperwork. Maybe now he could go home and actually eat dinner with his family for once, catch up with his youngest son, who was just touching eighteen now and was the only one still living at home. Hokage-sama? The door had been opened about three inches, and the brown eyes of one of the very Hokage slaves he'd been musing over just a second ago appeared in the crack. Hiroko-san. Come in, Saratobi invited. The Chunin nodded and pushed the door open, revealing herself to be holding a stack of papers. Um, these came from Suna just now, she said, placing them on his desk and retreating quickly. Saratobi saw the red band over them, marking them urgent, and sighed heavily. So much for dinner, he mused aloud, reaching for the top paper. Three years old, exactly. Kakashi hesitated a brief moment before opening the door leading to the small room Naruto slept in, not to be confused with his playroom. It was eight o'clock, more than two hours past the kid's bedtime, and accordingly Naruto was curled in bed, fast asleep and sucking his thumb. Today was his birthday. Today, three years ago, Sensei had given his life and condemned his son to save a village which, to date, had proved highly ungrateful. Three years is a long time, Kashi, swirled the voice of his teacher in his mind. Kakashi shook his head, banishing it. He knew his teacher would be horrified at how his son was being forced to live. He knew his teacher would want him to let him go enough to hold on to the boy who was still here, alive. But it was hard. Very carefully, unwilling to wake the toddler, Kakashi took a few steps forward and looked at him, tilting his head just a little. He looks fine, the ANBU thought to himself, before turning and leaving silently, closing the door securely behind him. In an instant, the boy was forced from his mind as he met up with the rest of his squad. He was a captain now, and he along with every ANBU not on a mission was slated to spend tonight policing the festival that was thrown in honor of the Yandame's defeat of the dreaded QB. Joy Leading his subordinates to the festival grounds, Kakashi couldn't hold back a sigh, feeling particularly world-weary. He hated this festival. Three years, two months old. Somebody's in trouble. Sang Rabbit, the female member of Kakashi's team, the moment the silver-haired man walked into the room that morning. He paused and looked at her, confused even though his mask. What are you talking about? He asked. She was grinning, he just knew it. Hokage wants you, she said airily. Better hurry. Don't want to be late. You have nearly she checked the clock hanging on the wall, dash seven whole minutes to get there. For a moment, Kakashi stared at her. Then, he deflated and shrugged. Eh? I'll be late then. He laughed as Rabbit's jaw dropped until her chin peeked out below her mask. After dallying a few minutes with his team, checking in with each of them, Kakashi headed off to the Hokage Tower. 
Once he arrived, he was waved in to see the Hokage without having to wait at all, so it was with a slight, hidden, smirk that he knocked on the Hokage's office door. Maybe there was method in Abito's madness, after all. It was murder standing at attention for the typical forty minutes it took the Hokage to get around to seeing you. Ah, dog, Saratobi said as the Hataki entered the office when prompted. A slight flicker of confusion passed over the old face. You're late. Only just, Kakashi said mildly. I hear you wanted to see me, Hokage-sama? Saratobi hesitated. He wasn't looking forward to this conversation. Not. At. All. Close the door, Kakashi, he said seriously. Kakashi paused when his name was spoken, and very slowly pushed the door until it clicked shut behind him. Then he reached up and removed his porcelain mask, coming further into the room. Sit down, the Hokage said, gesturing the chair across the desk from Saratobi. Wearily, Kakashi sat down, frowning at the old man. This couldn't be good. After an awkward pause, Saratobi leant forwards, steepled his fingers, and began to speak. Kakashi, I wonder if you are aware of the average life expectancy of an ANBU agent. The Hitaki frowned at the odd way of beginning, but replied anyway, six months, sir. And you have been in the force how long now? Saratobi asked. Three years, sir. Give or take a few weeks, Kakashi answered in turn. The Hokage nodded at him. Why did you join, Kakashi? He asked suddenly. Kakashi stiffened. My reasons are my own, he snapped, then winced. Sir, he added, trying to make it sound more polite. The Sandame just surveyed him seriously, unmoving. Kakashi felt himself grow hot and uncomfortable under the intensity of the look, and eventually shifted and said, Is there a problem, sir? Has something happened? Did my last psych evaluation come back below par, or have my superiors reported any problems with my conduct? After a moment, Saratobi shook his head. No, Kakashi. You are, as always, in top form. All I have heard about you are praises, in various states of crudeness, by the way. Kakashi winced, but the old man didn't call him on it. Kakashi, you have now been in ANBU six times the expected length of active duty, he began uncomfortably. As such, I believe the time has come for you to explore other opportunities. Kakashi froze. He knew what this was. This was the dreaded moment when he would be forcibly discharged from ANBU. It was inevitable. Hang around too long and refuse to either voluntarily retire or die, and the Hokage would pull you from the force. Something about protecting mentality or similar. Either way, Kakashi was stunned, unsettled, and frightened. He wasn't ready to face the world again. He hadn't seen any non NBU comrades since he joined NBU three years ago. Well, not out of uniform. Not when they recognized him, too. You're discharging me? He blurted, interrupting the Hokage mid sentence. Sarutobi stopped and considered him. Yes, he said simply. I think it is time for you to take a break from NBU, Kakashi. But I can't leave, Kakashi insisted. I can't. I, I don't think I can go back to being a Jounin, sir. You would be given special Jounin rank, Saratobi commented, specializing in assassination. But what would I do? Kakashi demanded. Teach? He barked out a laugh. No, I don't teach. Nah, I'd destroy the brats, first training session. I will find something to keep you busy, Saratobi said. Kakashi raked his hand through his hair, the look on his mostly hidden face almost desperate. Please, he said, don't cut me from the force. I, I need it. I need to be, busy. Pressured. Otherwise, otherwise I get nightmares, the memories. I, I need it, he said lamely. Saratobi watched him with concern. This very dependence is what makes me think you need a break, he said and I insist. This is not negotiable. Just a break, he added, holding up a hand to stem the protests that had begun to burst forth. In a few years' time, you may resubmit your application to rejoin the NBU. 
Agreed? Kakashi considered. Honestly, it seemed fair, logical, even. A good way to keep ANBU agents sane would be to rotate them, three years in ANBU, three years out, giving their minds time to recover. Very well, he said eventually. But the question still remains, what am I to do? Don't say teaching. The Hokage took a deep breath. Now the real fight began. Not teaching, yet, he agreed. I already have a mission I wish to assign you. Unranked. Kakashi stared. Unrank usually meant it was too dangerous and unpredictable to be ranked and frequently ended up being more deadly than S ranks. One could begin pulling weeds and end assassinating small children on an unranked mission. That was fine. Kakashi was good. He wasn't worried. But he was confused. Why would the Hokage forcibly drag him, kicking and screaming, out of ANBU, only to give him an ANBU-esque mission? This mission extends indefinitely, Saratobi continued. Kakashi felt his gut clench. He'd just gotten back from an eight-month long-term mission. Being back for two months had only begun to take the edge off the relief he had felt to being back in Kanoha, and he wasn't sure he was ready to leave again, this time indefinitely. This mission will take place in Kanoha, Saratobi continued, almost missing the way Kakashi's shoulders slumped slightly in relief, and then twitched in annoyance at the thought of being stuck in the village indefinitely. It is not a mission you may refuse. Kakashi sighed and placed the porcelain mask he still held in his hand gently down on the desk with a soft chink. What does this mission entail? He asked in a low voice. Saratobi hesitated. I suppose you could say it is, on the surface, a bodyguard detail, he said eventually. Kakashi's eye narrowed. If your next sentence contains the daimyo's wife, with or without that damnable kitten Tora, I will leave. Better a missing mean than that hell. Saratobi chuckled. No, no, he said, waving a hand to calm the, much, younger man. Kakashi's relief was obvious. Hesitating again, Saratobi decided to just brace and say it, and do his best to railroad Kakashi into doing his bidding. Kakashi, the child we will refer to as Pup is three years old now. It has been a little less than three full years since he was first taken into the custody of ANBU. I think the time has come to reintroduce him to Kanoha. Kakashi had gone stiff. Sir, I think that is a very bad idea, he stressed. Oh, Kami, you want me to guard him. Sir, if it comes out that Uzumaki Naruto wasn't in fact killed three years ago, and was in fact living in the very nerve center of our defenses, the villagers will riot. I'm skilled, yes, but I'm not that skilled. Nobody's that skilled. The kid will be slaughtered. Saratobi surveyed him with some amusement. Kakashi, when you first came to me with the idea of hiding him three years ago, you said that he should be placed back in the general community after an appropriate amount of time. I meant after ten or fifteen years. Kakashi exclaimed. You can't honestly think that people won't start to connect the dots if a boy exactly Naruto's age looking exactly like Naruto turns up in the orphanage and inevitably begins to show signs of being rather abnormal? That won't be an issue. He will be hidden in plain sight. No one will suspect anything, Saratobi said confidently. Kakashi stared at him. Have you been drinking? He asked frankly. Saratobi shot him an annoyed look. You, Kakashi, haven't been seen by any non anbu person since you joined Black Ops. I have, as you know, answered every question pertaining to your whereabouts by saying that you are on a long-term mission and vaguely alluding to the fact that you won't be back for some time. Now I have arranged for your honorable discharge from ANBU, and you are free to return to the village. No doubt your homecoming from that long mission away will be a cause for celebration among your peers. Meito Guy especially seems eager for your return. Kakashi winced. Saratobi pressed on. Also, it provides a unique opportunity to exploit. After all, who would question it if you were to come home with a child after a three-year absence? The so-dubbed mission babies are very common among ninja in this situation. The Hitaki froze up. He was smart enough to put the pieces together. No! He exploded instantly. I won't do that. No! 
He banged his fist down on the desk and Saratobi quickly lifted his teacup out of harm's way. Kakashi, he began, but the newly reinstated Jounin was talking over him. Even ignoring how utterly insane this idea is, he looks nothing like me. How are you going to explain that? He takes after his mother, Saratobi said dignifiedly. Bending down, he tugged open the third drawer and lifted out one of the files, the green one, offering it to Kakashi. The teen didn't take it, so he opened it for him and placed it in front of him. Unwillingly, the man skimmed the paper before him, eye resting on the photograph of a beautiful, smiling woman who very clearly resembled Naruto, right down to the whisker marks. Below was a profile. Funkita, he read out. Unlucky North. How appropriate. Deceased. Seventeen. Died in childbirth. Ouch, Hokage-sama. That counts as my fault, you know. Whisker marks tattoos, a symbol of her clan, similar to the Inazuka triangles. This is patently ridiculous. This whole monologue was said in the same unimpressed monotone. Saratobi met his single gray eye seriously. Why is it ridiculous? He asked. This will never work. Kakashi exclaimed. Never. I'm not the daddy type. Okay. Kakashi, if you had caused the child to be conceived while on a long mission, what would you do? The Sandame questioned pointedly. Kakashi didn't answer. He couldn't. He knew, knew, that if he really had through some horrifying mistake created a child, he would bring it home to Kanoha and be the best father he could to it. But that didn't mean he could swear someone was laughing at him. It sounded eerily like a Beto. No, he protested weakly. I, I can't do it. I'm not ready to be a father. I, do you really hate the kid that much? Surely there are better candidates than me? He tried to pretend he wasn't pleading. Saratobi raised an eyebrow. Kakashi, you are the best candidate. You know everything about the child, where he comes from and who and what he is, and yet you do not hate him. And, like it or not, you're the closest thing to family the boy has. If you want, think of it as paying off a debt. Kakashi bit back a groan. Of course, the Hokage had to bring that up. It was true that when his father had died, Minato had taken the newly orphaned Kakashi in and all but adopted him, would have adopted him if not for Kakashi's childish pride. If Minato had survived, he and Naruto would have been raised as brothers. The silver-haired man buried his face in his hands, guilt curling in his stomach. Hell, he mumbled into his hands. Hokage-sama, please. There has to be another option. Kakashi, Saratobi's voice was firm. This is non-negotiable. This is a direct order from your Hokage. You will take this mission. But his age. Kakashi burst forth. He's too old. It won't work, sir. People will know. Uzumaki Naruto was born three years, two months ago, Saratobi said seriously. He died two years, eleven months ago. Hataki Naruto was born 18 months ago. Kakashi stared at the old man, mentally calculating. That would mean he'd been conceived when Kakashi was about half a month into his 16th year. It'll never work, he protested. You can't pass Pup off as half his age. It's impossible. Saratobi shook his head. Tell me, what is the difference, proportion-wise, between an 18-month-old and a 3-year-old child? Kakashi mumbled, but Saratobi caught it. That's right. Not much. And Naruto is very small for his age. He could easily pass as a big almost two-year-old. It will work, Kakashi. I have already arranged for it. It's also backstopped. There are people in Lighting Country, which is where you were, by the way, who will swear to knowing Fion Kida their whole lives, and will mutter darkly about the bastard undercover ninja, you who she ended up falling for. Thanks, Kakashi said, highly sarcastic. He seemed to be wilting, his resolve crumbling when faced with Saratobi's onslaught. Come on, Kakashi, Saratobi said coaxingly. Do it for Minato, if nothing else. Ensure that his son has a home and someone who cares about him. There was a long, tense pause, 
before the last of Kakashi's resolve evaporated and he slumped forwards, resting his head on the desk. Fine, he groaned. Saratobi's face lit up. Excellent, he said, forcing Kakashi to lift his head by shoving the rest of the folders ferreted away in the third desk drawer at him. In here, you will find everything you need to know about the last three years of your life, the girl you were involved with and the child you created together. There is something fundamentally wrong with this, Kakashi remarked, his composure recovered, now reading with morbid fascination a series of extensive facts about a woman he had apparently been involved with for more than a year until she tragically died. They'd been the same age. She'd been the daughter of the local innkeeper, a good person to befriend if he wanted the local news and gossip, not to mention a reliable source on who was entering and leaving the town. Her father had threatened to kill him when he found out his daughter was pregnant. Kakashi had to feel impressed. It was an extensive cover story. There was even a mission report, nicely forged in his handwriting. Opening a new file, Kakashi found baby pictures and a birth certificate, as well as a profile for his son. Hataki Naruto, 18 months old, born April 3rd allergic to be stings in the pollen of a tree that only grew in the far northern reaches of lightning country. Weighing 18 kilograms, he stood 72 centimeters tall. Favorite color, orange. Any problems? Suggestions? Questions? Saratobi prompted. Kakashi, still flicking through papers, hummed contemplatively. What will we tell Pup? He asked. Naruto will be told the same as everyone else. Until he is old enough to understand, Saratobi said simply. Kakashi nodded, not looking up from his perusal. How do you propose I make it seem as though we have just returned from a long journey? He asked. Saratobi tapped another sheet of paper, and Kakashi picked it up. And laughed. Ah, he said, nodding. The obvious approach. Of course. On the paper was a map a travel path mapped out on it in red ink that would be easy enough for a child to navigate with a little help and would still make it appear as though whoever was walking it was coming from the general direction of lightning country. I want you and Naruto to go on a little journey for me, Saratobi said. That will give the child, and you, time to adjust. He needs to address and react to you in a manner that depicts that you are his father, not some stranger he's just met and you need a little time to get used to caring for a child before you hit the public eye, as well. I guarantee that the moment you step through Kanoha's gates when you return you'll be scrutinized, so it would be best to be convincing. The whole trip should take around two weeks, and by the end I imagine both of you will look as though you have just made a difficult, tiring journey from a foreign country. Kakashi rolled his eyes. Well, duh. When do I leave? he asked resignedly. Saratobi checked his watch, and Kakashi groaned loudly. Saratobi laughed. Kidding, he said. Tomorrow. Take tonight to memorize those files. You need to know them perfectly. And I'd suggest you put some of the photographs in your pack. You know. In case. Oh, and don't forget when packing that you have to have room for all Naruto's gear, too. Grumbling under his breath, Kakashi gathered the files into his arms and stood, moving away before the old man could say anything to further rip his world to pieces and rearrange it into something frightening. Outside, he stopped to lean against the hallway wall, breathing irregularly as it hit him exactly what he'd just agreed to. He was a father. Back in his office, Saratobi smiled at the ceiling and waited. After a pause of maybe seven minutes, the door opened and Kakashi appeared again glaring something awful. Wordlessly, without even looking down from a suddenly fascinating crack in the ceiling, Saratobi held out Kakashi's porcelain mask that had been forgotten. He had to fight a laugh as Kakashi snatched it and shunshined away. Three months old. Chapter 2, You Want Me to What? Eighteen months old, again. The next morning, Kakashi woke up as usual exactly three minutes before his alarm went off and swung himself off his bunk, instantly alert. Upon confirming that he was indeed still safe, relatively, in his quarters in the ANBU HQ, he sat down and stared blankly at the whitewashed wall until his alarm went off, jerking him out of his stupor. 
he jumped, and blearily rubbed his hand over his face, before beginning his morning rituals of washing, shaving, dressing and breakfasting. By the time he was done, it was 5 a.m. Here, Kakashi deviated from his normal pattern. Instead of grabbing his mask and moseying on down to meet up with his squad, collect a mission and leave, he swung his pack up onto his back, where it settled over his white standard-issue armor, his cloak tied to the outside of it in a neat roll. He hesitated over his mask, eventually deciding to place it over his face for the hell of it, and, after checking that he had left none of his personal effects in the room, strode out of his quarters for the last time. Walking slowly, he made his way through HQ, heading unwillingly but unerringly towards Naruto's bedroom. When he reached there, he pressed his hand onto the seal on the outside of the door, which was there to ensure only certain personnel could unlock the entrance to the kid's room, and as a way to keep the brat in one place damn it. The seal accepted him, and he pressed the door open, unaccountably nervous. It was early. The blonde toddler was still fast asleep in his cot. Kakashi took a few steps into the room and turned the light on. The sudden brightness woke the child, and he began to move, his face screwing up in protest at the light and a hand coming up to grind into his eye, his other hand and legs moving, stuck, beneath his soft blanket. Awa, he said blearily, looking around as he was lying down. He caught sight of Kakashi standing nearby and frowned at his upside-down view of the man. Doggy? he said questioningly. Kakashi hesitated one last time. This was his last chance to make a break for it. Good morning, pup, uh, Naruto, Kakashi stumbled. Had to get used to calling the brat by his name. Would look weird otherwise. Naruto sat up, still scrubbing at his eye. The blanket fell down to reveal his right arm clamped around that ragged toy dog mouse had gotten him two and a bit years ago. Wah. Doggy? Yes, Poo Naruto, it's me. Come on, we need to leave. You're going to live with me from now on, okay? So we're going to have to leave now. We need to pack up your things, okay? The blonde stared at him throughout this uncomfortable speech, and the only reply he gave was to raise his free arm in the universal child signal for pick me up. Kakashi obliged awkwardly, but it wasn't nearly as difficult as it had been last time he tried it when he was fourteen. Now, Naruto put a remarkably strong arm around his neck and sort of clung there himself, and all Kakashi needed to do was prop him up with his left forearm hooked under the boy's short, chubby thighs. Letting his pack slip to the ground, Kakashi nudged it open with his foot and withdrew several storage scrolls, and set about sorting through the boy's belongings. Really, he didn't have much, compared to many devil spawnings, uh, children. Kakashi knew, and he reasoned he'd be able to bring just about all of it. Soon, it was done. Naruto was all but asleep on his shoulder. Kakashi was highly uncomfortable. Okay. We're going to leave now, Naruto, he said softly. You just sleep. We're going on a little trip. You won't be coming back here. He turned to leave the room, but a small voice below his left ear said, Why? UFG Banky. Kakashi closed his eye. He honestly had no frickin' clue what the child had just told him. He had to teach him to speak better, even if that meant talking to him constantly. Sweeping the room with his gaze, he saw that the only thing he hadn't picked up was the soft blue blanket on the bed. With a sigh, he lifted it, and shuffling Naruto carefully, managed to lay it over his shoulder and lay Naruto on top of it ensuring that it would only fall and get lost if he dropped Naruto, and face it, that just wasn't happening. Somehow, Kakashi managed to stuff the filled scrolls into his pack and navigate the bag onto his back without dropping the toddler, but by the time he was done, he had a death grip on the small body, convinced he was about to fall, convinced that if he did fall, he'd break his neck and die. He just felt so fragile. So small, clinging so trustingly to an elite assassin. It almost seemed a crime to hold something so soft and innocent so close to such a blood-saturated soul as Kakashi's. Naruto wriggled uncomfortably, and Kakashi made a conscious effort to relax his grip just slightly before the blonde woke up completely from his doze. Um, we're going to... go, 
Now, the silver-haired man said uncomfortably. He wasn't used to narrating his life for others. He didn't even enjoy telling those he was directing where he was going to be and what he was going to do. And the kid wasn't exactly answering. But he did have to sort of talk to him, right? Kakashi wasn't good at small talk, so telling the baby everything he was doing was a good way to fill up his word quota. Readjusting the child in his arms until he was holding him up against his chest with both arms, the boy's legs around his waist and small arms hugging his neck, soft gold hair tickling his ear as Naruto rested his head on his shoulder, Kakashi exited the room, moving swiftly and covertly to escape ANBU headquarters. He really didn't want to run into any ANBU members and be forced to say goodbye. In fact, he had plans to be well out of the village by the time a morning meeting was called and the force as a whole was informed that he had been discharged. He hated goodbyes. And hellos. And talking in general. People were annoying. Naruto began to wake up and got increasingly more and more squirmy as the day progressed. By about seven o'clock, Kakashi placed him on the ground to walk along beside him, bidding him to stay close and keep up. Half an hour and five hundred meters later, he realized that a simple command hadn't really gotten through to the three-year-slash-eighteen-month-old boy who had never been outside before, that he could remember, at least. Naruto, come on, he said, as the toddler stopped yet again to examine a flower. Those blue eyes flashed up to Kakashi's still-masked face and a pout formed. The boy looked dangerously near refusing to obey, so Kakashi gritted his teeth and took the dreaded step. He held out his hand to the blonde. Instantly, through part delight and part conditioned response, Naruto slipped his much smaller hand trustingly into Kakashi's large one, consenting to being pulled along at a slow walk. It wasn't long before Naruto started flagging, lagging behind and relying more heavily on Kakashi to pull him along. The Jounin cast him mind about, trying to figure out what was wrong, before he realized that the toddler wasn't used to walking very far at all. But they had a long journey. Kakashi tried to think back to when he'd been three. He had vague memories of trips out of village with his father when he'd been very young, before his father had gotten so incredibly busy. Ignoring the hot shards of pain that always lanced through his heart whenever he thought of his father, Kakashi mentally reviewed the man's strategy for caring with his young son when they were going to be walking for a long time. Kakashi remembered he would walk in the morning, after breakfast, and then inevitably get tired after an hour or so and be carried by his father, falling asleep on the man's back or shoulder, until he woke up and they ate lunch. Then he would either walk some more or demand a ride on his father's shoulders, and he would be alternately carried or walk until the sun went down, and they stopped to make camp, eat dinner, listen to Tu San and occasionally Jiraiya Sama, if he was there, tell stories, and sleep the night. Right. Kakashi could do this. He nodded decisively. He would follow the same general pattern, he decided, reaching for Naruto to lift him off his tired feet. He would carry him for a while, until... Wait. Dinner. Lunch. Breakfast. Kakashi swore aloud when he realized he had completely forgotten to feed the kid. Naruto wasn't one of his ANBU teammates, who'd slept in and needed to be roused. He had a responsibility to supply food. Well, that makes it break time, I guess, Kakashi thought dryly, deciding to stop right there beneath the trees. Without further fuss, he simply folded his legs and sank onto the leaf litter with a certain trained grace, crossing his long legs beneath himself. Naruto looked at him curiously for a moment, before he mimicked the older man, sitting down with a clumsy thump and crossing his short, stubby legs, wide blue eyes watching the older Kanahan for a clue as to what was going on. Are you hungry, Naruto? Kakashi asked, digging in his backpack. It was impossible to miss the way that the toddler's eyes lit up. Undry! He shouted, clapping his hands. Eat. Please? Yes, you can have breakfast now, Kakashi said absently, still rooting through his pack. Eventually, he came up with a soft bread sandwich, toddler-friendly, which he handed to the boy making grabby motions at him and edging closer on his bottom eagerly. Kakashi had to restrain a wince at how enthusiastically the baby began to eat. 
Okay. I have to remember to feed him. Important. Carefully reaching up, he removed the white and red mask that was fitted over his face with a sigh. He should probably stop wearing it, he admitted to himself. He wasn't in Anbu anymore. He let a finger trace over the pattern of a snarling dog that was painted onto it before quickly tying it onto the outside of his backpack. A glance told him Naruto as staring at him, mouth open, giving Kakashi a nauseating view of a bite of half-chewed bread and butter. E.W. What? he asked. Naruto chewed twice and swallowed rapidly, emptying his mouth enough that he could level one finger at Kakashi's nose and say, We're face off. Okay, Smee. Kakashi closed his eye, mentally analyzing that. What the hell? Was the kid even speaking the same language as him? What was he trying to say? Well, it probably had something to do with his mask coming off. Come to think of it, the only person Naruto had ever seen without a mask was the Hokage. Yes, I took my mask off, he said, taking a guess and hoping he got the kid's meaning right. This is my face. Well, kinda. He didn't want to remove his Hittite and cotton face mask as well. Naruto narrowed blue eyes warily at him. Doggy? He asked suspiciously. Kakashi blinked. Was the kid. Either way, it would be best to change the form of address now, to give them both time to get used to it. Daddy, Kakashi enunciated clearly, touching his own chest. Daddy? Naruto tilted his head, confusion written over his face. Duh, D? He repeated uncertainly. Kakashi nodded. Daddy, he confirmed. I'm Daddy. Daddy? Naruto sounded marginally more sure. Kakashi nodded. Un. Now eat your food. We need to get moving. After a long pause, during which Naruto frowned at the man almost skeptically, he turned back to chewing his bread with half a set of teeth. The rest had yet to grow through. Kakashi sighed with relief. Heard a one down. Now, he was up for two fun-fun weeks of father-son bonding. A weary teenager heaved a small child a little higher on his hip. Though he could usually carry weights much heavier than 18 kilograms for much longer than he'd been carrying this one, it was a totally illogical but cruelly true law of the universe that young children got heavier the longer you carried them. Naruto was resting his cheek against Kakashi's shoulder. His blanket was draped around him like a cloak to keep the evening chill away, and Oink was crushed between his stomach and Kakashi's chest. He was holding a plastic baby's bottle filled with formula that had been mixed with water from Kakashi's flask and heated with a mild katan jutsu. He was sucking on it slowly, his eyes heavy. He did hope Daddy would find a place to stop soon. He was really tired, but couldn't sleep well when he was being jostled by the man's movements. They had been out here in this strange place for a long time, more bedtimes than Naruto could count. He liked it out here with big green and brown fresh-smelling things Daddy had told him were called trees and weird things that moved all by themselves but were either doggies nor froggies. But he liked it most of all because Daddy was with him all the time and he was never left alone. Dimly, Naruto realized Daddy had stopped and was setting out a sleeping bag with one hand. The first night they'd spent out here, Naruto had had a bad dream, and Daddy had picked him up and hugged him until they fell asleep together. Ever since then, Naruto would always curl up against Daddy and go to sleep right there when they stopped. He liked this bit of the day the best, and he didn't even like bedtime. But Daddy was big and strong and brave and scary, and he made the bad dream monster stay away, and Naruto loved snuggling up against his chest and feeling his strong arms hug him and knowing that when he woke up Daddy would be right there. M.M. Daddy he said sleepily as he found himself set on the ground and the other man began to unbuckle his small shoes. Yes, Naruto? Daddy answered. Naruto was too sleepy to even really look at him as he said, when we go a G air? Daddy had said they were going somewhere special, to a new home where they were going to live. Over the last few days, he told Naruto quite a bit about it, and Naruto wanted to know how long until they reached the mysterious place. Long time, Naruto, Daddy grunted, 
slipping into the sleeping bag and carefully lowering Naruto onto his chest, arranging the boy comfortably. A week and a half, or more. Naruto nodded drowsily even though he didn't understand, his eyes closing as he slipped into unconsciousness. For a while, Kakashi lay and looked down at the soft blonde hair that obscured his vision, even though he was exhausted and couldn't seem to get enough sleep these days. As bizarre as it was, Naruto had taken to him like a duck to the water. It would be easier than he had supposed to convince Konoha they were a family when they arrived in one or two weeks' time. There would be no need to explain away Naruto's standoffish behavior, simply because he didn't display any. No, all that would be needed was an act on Kakashi's part, a show of fatherly affection towards the kid. It didn't need to be overdone either. Kakashi winced at the thought of acting like those simpering idiots who fawned over their kids. No. That would fool no one. No, he just needed to pretend he loved the brat. Itch. He'd been practicing for the last couple of days, and he thought he'd gotten pretty good at it. The XANBU effortlessly squashed the twinge of guilt he felt in his soul at deceiving the child like this, especially since it was obvious the toddler had, through some miracle, bonded with him. But Naruto didn't ever need to know that daddy's affections were false. He'd even gotten better at interpreting the baby babble. Absently, Kakashi raised a hand to smooth and pet the downy soft blonde hair, shifting a little so he could see the boy's face. Naruto was fast asleep, sucking his thumb unconsciously, his half-full bottle lying forgotten in his other hand. Kakashi frowned a little, one gloved hand moving to tug the thumb out of Naruto's small mouth. He'd have to break that habit. Instantly, with a rustle of cloth, Oink's fluffy tail took the place of Naruto's thumb in the child's mouth, and Naruto snuggled deeper into his blankets, sucking firmly on the plaything. Kakashi winced. That definitely explained why the toy was so tattered. Breaking the habit had suddenly become a top priority. Right below toilet training. Even if it was kind of, you know, cute. Relief coursed through Kakashi. He had just spotted the gates that allowed entrance into Konoha up ahead. They were home. The journey that had easily been the most exhausting and nerve-wracking of his life, including that time he'd had to drag home an unconscious teammate from IWA whilst nursing a stomach wound and being chased by a small army, was finally over. It had been a trying two weeks. Were children supposed to leak like that? Naruto, who was walking on his own this morning, Holding Oink, noticed the gates about ten minutes later and stopped short. Daddy, ISSUR? We air? He asked, blue eyes turning to his guardian for confirmation. Kakashi glanced at him and nodded. Yes, Naruto. This is Konoha. Home, he corrected himself. This is home. Those familiar eyes lit up and suddenly the toddler transformed into some kind of miniature yellow flash as he darted ahead moving with mind-boggling speed the way only a toddler can. No, you don't, Kakashi muttered, quickly flashing through some hand signs, activating a jutsu a kindly innkeeper had shown him two nights ago. A chakra leash activated and snapped out to catch Naruto, pulling the pouting boy gently back to his father's side. No F.A., he whined. Yes, fair, Kakashi countered. Remember what I said about running off. Bad Naruto. Instantly, the baby's expression turned from excited but thwarted to horrified and contrite. I'm sore, he wailed, latching onto Kakashi's leg. Kakashi sighed and patted his head. It's all right. Just try to remember next time, okay? You could get hurt, running off alone. Naruto nodded, a toddler's promise to be good, and together the pair approached the gates. One of the two chunin guarding the gate glanced up as they came into his field of vision. Seeing only a young man and a small child, not likely to be threat, he glanced back down, only to do a double take as the man's identity, and the fact he was traveling with a toddler of all things made it through to his head. Kakakashi san Yelp chunin a. Kakashi neither knew nor cared what his name was, tired as he was. Why you're back? Stuttered chunin b. Kakashi nodded once as he paused at their booth, 
his single eye sparing them a glance before fixing back on Naruto with parental paranoia. The village has missed you, offered Shunane. Kakashi spared a second in his Naruto watching to shoot him a dull look. Chunin-A winced. Um, who is this? Chunin B tried, looking at where a small blonde person was trying his utmost to push the heavy gate into the village closed. His name is Hataki Naruto, Kakashi said shortly. He has no passport. However, as an ANBU, I can authorize his entry. So just mark my name on your list and wave us through, okay? Um, yeah, you can do that. Chunin B agreed quickly, scrawling something down on the nearest scroll. Go on through. Don't forget to hand in your report, and it's good to see you back, Kakashi-san. Kakashi gave a snort of disbelief, but summoned Naruto to his side with a tug on the chakra leash and moved through the gates. Chunin A didn't seem able to let it go. Wait. Hataki Naruto, is he related to you? Like your kid or ouch? Kakashi smirked without turning to see what had happened. He knew. Chunin B had just stomped Chunin A's uncovered toes. Quite hard from the sound of it. Beside and below him, Naruto was practically writhing in excitement, and Kakashi idly wondered how long until he exploded. He could practically hear the kid's gears whirring ten times faster than usual, trying to keep up. His head swiveled, obviously attempting to take in everything going on around him as they began there, way too long, walked to the Hokage Tower to report, Naruto sliding his small hand into his father's for a measure of reassurance in the new, exciting and slightly frightening place. They had nearly made it when. Dynamic entry. Ah, crap, Kakashi said, firmly and loudly. Glancing down, he tugged on the hand in his. You're never to say that word, you hear? he said sternly to the kid. Naruto, who had been watching a confrontation between a pigeon and a shopkeeper on the other side of the road, turned his big eyes up to look at Daddy. Awa, he said, thumb in mouth and oink balanced precariously on his elbow. Kakashi twitched. Cute. My youthful rival Kakashi, you have returned. Yash, today the springtime of youth are in full bloom. It is good to see you again, my friend. Naruto, suddenly devoid of the adventuring courage he'd possessed until the spandex-wearing creature had appeared before them, tugged his hand out of Kakashi's and suckered himself to the man's left leg like some kind of particularly stubborn barnacle. Wrapping his arm around Kakashi's shin, his cheek rested neatly in the cleft of Kakashi's knee, his other thumb still firmly in his mouth. I have missed you, rival Kakashi. Guy was declaring to the rapidly emptying street. Do not think I have forgotten our competition. No, you will not escape that easily. The flames of youth will triumph over your hip and coolness. The score currently stands at 15 to 16, in my favor. We shall, oh. Who is this champion of youth who stands close to you? Kakashi debated the pros and cons of several answers. But Naruto saved him the trouble by pulling his thumb out of his mouth with a wet popping noise and slapping the slimy, you, hand over his left ear, saying, E O U, Daddy. Owe. Oh, Kakashi bit back a snigger. Yes, he is, he agreed, patting the blonde head consolingly. Guy looked from tall to short Hataki and back again. Kakashi, am I right in thinking that you understand his youthful words? He asked, slightly confused. Kakashi nodded shortly. I do. He said he's loud, daddy. Ouch. So, please. Inside voices, guy. You're hurting his ears. Ah. Uh, I am sorry, young. Guy. Inside voices. I'm sorry, my young friend, guy tried again. I will keep my voice lowered. And if I can't, I will swim fifty lengths of the river whilst chewing rocks. And then... Did you say daddy? Kakashi sighed slightly. He was torn between amusement and dread at this conversation. Ah, well, might as well get it over with. Squaring his shoulders, he said, I did. Guy, this is my son. Naruto, this is Gaisan. For a moment, Guy looked remarkably unguy like. His grin slid off his face. 
to be replaced with a grim sort of expression Kakashi had rarely seen, which looked rather out of place on Guy's features. Your son? He repeated seriously. Who is his mother? Girl from the village I was staying in, Kakashi said, meeting the green-clad Chunin's eyes unflinchingly. Guy frowned at him. Kakashi, my friend, while I understand you wishing to keep your son, was it not perhaps unwise to tear a son from his mother? Guy asked in a low voice, dark concern tinging his question. After all, what do you know about raising a child? Hung on said but unmistakable in the air between felt himself stiffening and drawing up to stand at his full height in a response to the query, one hand reaching to rest possessively on Naruto's messy head. Kida is dead, he said flatly. It was accept responsibility for the child or abandon him for his village to raise. I believe I took the only option. Guy closed his eyes for a moment at the news, and Kakashi cringed as was he suddenly enveloped in a hug. I am sorry for your loss. The loss of love at such a young age as ours. My heart bleeds for you, my rival. This was shouted at the top of Guy's powerful lungs, right into Kakashi's right ear. Can't breathe, he muttered, and Guy eventually released him. Tears were streaming down the other man's cheeks. Kakashi winced. He cries so easily. Again, he swore he heard Abito's hysterical laughter. Guy, it's okay. Really. It was eighteen months ago, when Naruto was born. I'm fine. Seriously, Guy. Stop crying. Um, tears are unyouthful. There we go. Guy wiped his eyes, the flood of manly sobs dying down rapidly. In a few moments, he was calm enough to grin again. He knelt before the Hataki pair, putting himself roughly on Naruto's level. The blonde surveyed the weirdo warily. Hello, most excellent and youthful child of my rival, Kakashi, he said brightly. I am Mado Guy, Kanova's green beast. Naruto frowned, tilted his head, looked Guy up and down with his bright blue eyes, and then leaned around his father's leg and said clearly, Froggy. Then he placed his thumb in his mouth and held up his other hand for his father to lift him. As Kakashi obeyed, hoisting the child into the air, he couldn't help it. He began to laugh. A small shadow crept across the floor, raised up on tiptoes to minimize noise. Sunlight peeked in through the window and bounced off bright golden hair, making the shadow shine a little in the small, one-room apartment. Grinning, Naruto took two more steps and pounced. Kakashi jolted awake as something small cannon balled his stomach. Oof. Daddy, daddy, up, up, up. Naruto squealed from his midriff. Unfortunately, by the time Kakashi realized who had attacked him, he was halfway through a counter move and a second later had Naruto pinned beneath him, one arm firmly behind him and a kunai pressed at the back of his neck. There was a two-second pause before Kakashi snatched the knife away and let Naruto's twisted arm go, pushing himself up to get his weight off the small, fragile body. He felt sick. Naruto was so small, he must have hurt him. He'd attacked him. A baby. He was a horrible guardian. Naruto would be injured, and the Hokage would take him away and give him to someone else, and why was his chest hurting and he didn't have time for this and oh god oh god is Naruto hurt why isn't he moving shit shit shit. The boy then did something that threw Kakashi's panicking mind for a loop. He started giggling. Naruto had been stunned when Daddy had flipped him over and pinned him face down on the mattress, and it had taken a moment to realize what had happened, and then that he'd been let go. Then he'd started to laugh. Daddy was good at playing. This was a fun game. Sitting up, he squirmed around until he was facing Daddy once more and dived at him again, head butting his chest and attempting, futilely, to force Daddy back down on the bed. One of Daddy's arms came up around him, pinning him again against the man's chest this time, and Naruto squealed happily, wriggling energetically in his grip. Kakashi's mind was frozen, unsure of how to respond to this situation. Clearly, the blonde wanted revenge for pinning him down like that. Kakashi's gut clenched guiltily, but he was grinning like a mad thing and his squeals didn't sound angry, scared or frustrated. No, instead he seemed almost 
Happy? Kakashi was suddenly seriously concerned there was something very wrong with the boy. Naruto had managed to squirm out of his grasp, but just leapt right back at his father, this time aiming higher. Kakashi's body reacted automatically before his mind could stop it, grabbing the attacker out of the air, twisting him around and catching him in a headlock. Kakashi froze. Crap. Once was enough, but then I went and did it again. Even if he wasn't injured before, he certainly was now. What do I do? I... I can't keep him around if I can't keep myself from attacking him. Crap, I must have heartburn. My chest hurts. The train of thought was cut off as once again, Naruto began shrieking with laughter and squirming in his arms. Gone! He shouted at the top of his lungs, in between writhes and shrieks of laughter. Gone, gone, gone! He managed to tear himself out of Kakashi's, loose, grip and instantly launched a new attack. Kakashi grabbed him, mind whirring. Was he saying again? Was he having fun? He wasn't hurt. He wasn't scared. Could that be real? Looking down at the grinning blonde, however, Kakashi had to concede that yes, he was having fun. This was all a big game to the toddler. Hell. I want to live in Naruto's mind, he thought to himself, hesitantly reaching to swing the child into the air and then toss him gently down onto the mattress again. It had been three days since they had returned to Kanoha. Kakashi had set up a crib in his small, one-room apartment, but the little brat had recently figured out how to escape from it. Bloody imaginative children. Child safe should mean child safe, damn it. Rolling his eyes and shoving the brat down when he tried to squirm to his knees, Kakashi mused that there were days he could truly appreciate that Naruto was indeed Kushina's son. Naruto was happily seated on his blankie, which was spread out on the limited floor space of Daddy's apartment, happily arranging the painted wooden blocks Daddy had given him, occasionally lifting one to chew absently. There were noises outside the closed door, but he didn't listen to them, too intent on his game. Four, five, ah, uh, here we are. This is Kakashi-san's house. Are you sure? Yeah, number six. Come on, Kurinai. I wanna see the baby. Dad says it's real cute. I heard it looks nothing like him. I'm not even convinced the baby exists, with all the rumors flying around. Oh. Hey, Genma. Are you visiting Kakashi-san too? Yeah. I'm curious as to how he got the kid in the first place. I'd figure the usual way, Genma. You think? I just always thought Kakashi was too. I don't know, frigid for any kind of, intimate interaction. Che. Please. There's a complete difference between shunning human contact and refusing sex. Anko. Why are you here? Same reason you are, dumbass. To see the baby. Well, mostly to see if I can get into Kakashi's pants. But it amounts to the same thing, really. What? No, it doesn't. That's sick, Anko. Cough, cough, cough. Hey, you go and hate. You here to see the kid, too? Duh. Cough, cough. Yes. Cough. The door swung open and Naruto glanced up from his game to see a whole bunch of people there. But they didn't move, so he ignored them, unaware or uncaring of their conversation. That's him? Why is he alone? Cough, cough. Are we sure Kakashi is up to being a dad? He has to be. He doesn't have a choice, Yugago. He doesn't look anything like Kakashi. I don't know. He seems familiar. Well, I don't even think they're related. Cough, cough. How old is it anyway? He is 18 months old. He's big. I don't think he's Kakashi's kid. Cough, cough, cough. Yes, we heard Asuma. Now shut up. All I can say is, she must have been hot to finally break down Kakashi. Enko, Kakashi's been sleeping with people for years. Mission stuff. He just doesn't do it for recreation. Man, what a tool. Cough, cough. Don't be mean. Naruto, 
totally unaware that the strangers were currently discussing his father's sexual exploits, began arranging the blocks so that the katakana characters on each one strung together to make words. He'd been taught the beginnings of reading by one of the white-faced men that used to look after him. He didn't notice that the watching crowd had gone silent as he spelled out doggy, froggy, yes, sup, and a funny arrangement he'd been shown by Bear that always got interesting results out of the grown-ups. When he was done, he had about six blocks left over. He examined them, but couldn't make any more words out of the sounds painted on them, so with a sound of disgust, he lifted one of them and threw it at the bucket they'd been stored in, which was standing at the opposite end of the blankie. He'd been taught how to throw stuff by a pair of the white-faced men, and had lots of fun practicing it, so he quickly threw the remaining five blocks at the bucket, grinning delightedly at the clanging sounds they made when they landed neatly in the metal container. The watching teenagers had begun whispering again. Cough, cough. Did you see that? He's eighteen months old. Well, it's definitely Kakashi's kid. Bang goes the baby snatcher theory. He's so cute. Cough, cough, cough. Look at the words he spelt. He got shuriken right. How did he do that? Oh, great, another super freak. Cough. Kakashi will be horrible. There'll be no living with him. Come on, let's go inside. I'm sick of standing in the hallway. Naruto looked up in alarm as there was a sudden movement, and all at once a half dozen strangers rushed inside, right at him. Instantly, he screamed, flinching backwards as he shrieked at the top of his lungs in the desperate hope that Daddy would come and rescue him. There was a loud crash and a tinkle, and Daddy burst through the window in a shower of broken glass, landing in front of his son in a battle ready position. Can I out? and a feral father mode touched my son and I look in his eye. Naruto stopped screaming and instead grinned at the suddenly petrified strangers. After a moment, Daddy seemed to relax, lowering the shiny knife thing Naruto was never allowed to touch. Asuma? Karinai? Genma Yugago, hate. Enko, do I even want to know why you are causing my son to scream in holy terror? He asked darkly. The others winced in unison. Hate moved his hand to his mouth, and his shoulders shook as he coughed. We didn't mean to scare him, Karinai said softly. We didn't know he'd be afraid of us. He has a good head on his shoulders. Stranger danger, and all that, Kakashi retorted, placing his kunai back in his pouch and turning to lift the toddler making desperate up motions off the glass shard-covered ground. Asuma, Genma. I'm choosing to blame you, meaning that it's now your job to fix the window I just finished repairing when I was forced to crash through it to rescue my son from unknown assailants. The guests had the grace to look ashamed, and Asuma and Genma began to mutter their agreement, while the others sheepishly tried to sweep or gather up the sharp glass pieces. Within twenty minutes, the apartment was cleaned and child safeified to Kakashi's satisfaction. He settled on the bed, holding a shy Naruto on his lap and said okay. Now that he isn't in danger in his own home cute dirty slash contrite looks. This is my son, Hataki Naruto. Neru, these are a bunch of idiots. Say hello. Happy now that daddy was holding him, Naruto flashed a smile around the room and waved a small hand, saying, Ayo. Okay. Why are you all here? Kakashi asked before his guests could speak. The group of teenagers in his apartment alternately frowned, grinned, and coughed. To see the baby, silly, Yugago said brightly, patting hate on the back as he dissolved into a coughing fit. Kakashi frowned at him suspiciously. He had better not get Naruto sick, he threatened ominously. Okay, you've seen him, can you leave now? Ah, Kakashi-kun, pouted Anko, sitting close to him on the bed and sliding her arm around his back. Yeah, Kakashi, don't be mean, Genma added. We brought presents, Kurina announced, offering Kakashi the brightly wrapped package. Wouldn't be a baby shower without them, agreed Asuma, his grin positively evil. There was a pause as everyone waited for Kakashi's reaction. I hate you all, he said dully. Fine. Have at it. Naruto's eyes had lit up and he reached for the shiny, 
bright colored box held in the tall woman with red eyes hands. Pwedi! He cooed as his father allowed him to catch and chew the ribbon it was tied with. Kakashi seriously considered setting off a bomb just to clear his apartment. If not for the fact that Naruto was also in the room, he probably would have. Knock knock! Called a cheerful voice from the open doorway. Kakashi glanced up and groaned aloud when he saw some of the adults, his sensei's generation, poking their heads in. We heard there was a party going on here, Inoichi said brightly. I'm hungry, commented Chiza as he forced his way through teenagers, somehow squeezing into the small room. All this baby stuff is so troublesome, Shikaku added, dropping a box onto the gradually growing pile on the table. I wouldn't even be here, but my wife nags, and when some told her, man, marriage sucks. And the kid cries, you know? He's not even properly toilet trained. Itch. His blonde friend patted his shoulder sympathetically. I know what you mean. My daughter's impossible. Everyone, make a hole. Sim began bodily shoving at the people between her and the teenage boy cowering on the bed, curled protectively around the baby. People scrambled and banged into each other, trying to tackle the logistical nightmare that was allowing movement in the overly crowded room. Soon, Sim had made it to the bed, and she quickly shoved Anko aside so she could sit next to their host. Give me the baby, she ordered. Kakashi hesitated, but didn't really dare to disobey so he cautiously handed a very clingy Naruto over to the wild woman. Naruto looked at him like he'd been betrayed, and Kakashi cringed, but didn't move to take him back. H.M. Sum was examining him, looking at him with her sharp brown eyes. He's cute, but he looks nothing like you, she commented. How old? Eighteen months, Kakashi muttered. Sum grinned. He's big, she remarked. That's good. Is he a handful? My two UNS keep me run off my feet, let me tell you. Who was his mother? Her name was Kida, Kakashi ground out, mentally contemplating the pros and cons of suicide. Picture? Sim said in a clipped voice, arranging a squirming blonde child on her lap so that he couldn't escape. Kakashi dug in his pocket and pulled out the rather battered photograph of the fictitious woman he'd been given. Sim took it and clucked. Well, he definitely takes after her. Let me see, Anko demanded, grabbing it. Ooh, she was hot. See, Genma? The photograph was quickly passed around the room. H.M., yes, he does definitely take after her, Karina said, holding the picture. But he has his father's eyes, see? Yugago added. His mother's color, but his father's shape. Kakashi suddenly joined hate in coughing. Yeah, I can see that, some agreed, peering at the kid. He smells similar too. Cough, cough, cough. Dynamic entry. Guy leapt through the empty window pane. Kakashi, did you know your window seems to be missing? Yeah, guy, Kakashi sighed, reclaiming Naruto, who looked like he might cry at the arrival of the loud and green one. The idiots broke it. He jerked his head at his guests. Y-O-S-H. How unyouthful. I shall fix your window, my friend. If I cannot, I shall do five hundred laps of the village. On one foot. I, where did Kakashi-san go? Kakashi had used the distraction guy was to grab the toddler and run, and was now walking calmly down the street three blocks away while in his arms Naruto laughed and hugged him, and then began to suck his thumb again. Reaching to tug the thumb out of his son's mouth, Kakashi sighed heavily. If every day was like today, he wasn't sure he'd survive parenthood. That's it for part one. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.